Uh, hello, we are back again, and I am joined by Sante and Dori. We are here once again. Topic for today is Band-Aid Solutions. Uh, we are talking about, uh, within the events of today, uh, the kind of solutions that are being presented that are either uh, helpful or just uh, uh, band-aids mm -hmm. to the gaping wound that exists in our society. Um, to just start off, I was, I was interested in, in the events that have been going on and the way they've been covered in the media. Uh, so a large component of how we perceive or, you know, we get our news uh, is how the media uh, presents it to, uh, to the majority, to the population. And it's very curious uh, the ways that, that that is done and very interesting with uh, social media, how that comes into play as well. So uh, I had come across an article called uh, that America is currently obsessed with Band-Aid solutions over these uh, social ills that are going on uh, with the event uh, of, of the fire that happened here in Iceland. Uh, which involved a large, uh, the immigrant population. Um, personally, I'm not a big news uh, person in, in Iceland. I don't really follow the news. I know most Icelanders do follow the news religiously. Um, I don't know if you guys have, a, have a, a, a take on that kind of culture, because in the States, you know, uh, we get our news, but it's not like six o'clock here. It's like, Get the coffee. Turn on the news. Yeah. Uh, I never experienced that living in the states, but here it's definitely a thing. So, you guys have anything to say about that? I would say the news, in, at least stateside, it's not always very well informed. So, it's not something that you should be always tuning into at six o'clock, um, as religiously as it is here, because uh, as we kind of know here, it's a it's a big deal. Like you said, get the coffee. Let's sit down. We watch the news. Um, I feel here it can. It can also kind of have uh, that effect uh, with some people um, where it's not necessarily good for them to be watching this thing. It depends how you interpret it, what's being said. Um, so I feel <clears throat> there is that cultural difference, but also in some ways it can be the same depending on where you're intaking your media from or your news. Yeah, I feel like, well, first of all, media is going to come into play in basically every discussion we have <laughs> because we're getting it somewhere. We're getting our news, our information from somewhere all the time, all day long. Now it's, you know, it's in here. So um, I grew up in a house that stopped everything for the news because at, at a certain time in American history, the news actually was news ish. <laughs> it was, it had more information in it than disinformation, at least in my house. Um, but then it changed very quickly, especially after the Reagan era into um, deeply sensationalized uh, fluff and, you know, scare tactics, especially in New York where <laughs> suddenly uh, during um, especially the crack e epidemic, every story was something horrifying and um, grating. And I stopped watching the news just on my own. I was like, I can't do this. My parents wanted me to watch it, but I was like, nope, I can't. I just can't. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say coming here, it was refreshing to see a return to what I knew as a kid. But at the same time, I realized that there were plenty of households watching that in conjunction with Fox News. Mm -hmm. conjunction with entertainment news and all of this and, and gathering that as um, information about what's happening in America and what's happening in the world. So um, yeah, I think we're in an interesting point in history where things can really shift and sort of wrapping that around the, the Band-Aid solutions, um, seeing just how much media plays a part in that and how we need to be which is what we're doing by, by doing this show, proactive and making sure that those apparently superficial solutions do something, you know, and, and like um, loading them up with actual action. So mm -hmm. yeah, the news, the media and action. Let's see what we get. 
Now, what's interesting to me, you know, ever since I left high school, I had like a, a, a just a voracious appetite for just like educating myself or just learning about things, right? And uh, I remember reading, I, I got my hands on an old Black's Law. Uh, I don't know if it was a dictionary. It was some kind of law book that was talking about cases, you know, from like the beginning of the United States to now. These, these uh, precedent cases. And one that was curious to me was one that involved the guy who was accused of murder. He was innocent, but the way the media had, the newspapers at the time, which is just print media, the way they covered it was sort of sensational by having artists draw renditions of the crime scene and everything. And what happened was they couldn't give this guy a fair trial because everybody had consumed media about this mm -hmm. particular murder and had already come to cast judgment on this particular individual. This, this is so like he, the Central Park Five. We were all there for yeah, that. I mean, that yeah. Was so I was curious. I was interesting. It was interesting to me how long ago the interaction between like an event, the the people involved in the event, and how it's how it's disseminated into the, the masses, and then what that means mm -hmm. from that point on. Mm -hmm. So that was curious to me. And I always bring up um, the uh, John Ehrlichman, uh, who was in the Nixon administration, who um, was, was talking about there are two enemies to the, the Nixon administration with blacks and hippies, because they were all about the war. And this whole war on drugs really came out of the idea that he said that, uh, you know, we can arrest their leaders and, and, and demonize them every night on the evening news. I mean, mm -hmm. quote, those were taken from notes mm -hmm. that and a reporter had did uh, with him. Uh, and it's from a book called Smoke and Mirrors, which is an interesting uh, title for the book, mm -hmm. but that he knew using the media would then kind of get this perspective uh, on, on the people they wanted to target. And I thought that was something that I never knew and I don't think most people understand or know. So when they watch things like, like Fox News or something like this, they're not thinking, is there a, an agenda behind what they're telling me? They're just taking it in as if it's fact. Which is interesting uh, because, you know, in the days of like when they say Walter Cronkite and all these venerated uh, news people that were just there to tell the truth, supposedly, um, that that perception that, oh, they, they're not lying to us. You know, why would they lie to us? You know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, black people are, are on drugs and the, and the hippies and stuff. Mm -hmm. Why would they lie to us? And if you like crime novels and mysteries like I do, they always say, look for the motive and often follow the money, right? Mm -hmm. so, and I, I uh, think it's also important to take a note from A Clockwork Orange because, you know, we've been exposed to so much of it that, that we <laughs> start to believe that crap ourselves mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. each other and the distrust within. So, um, you know, when you're just, your eyes are pinned open and this is all that you see, you know, or this is all that's coming at you, it's really very difficult to have discernment, which is why, so, you know, in my house, we started watching Sky News and um, other world news broadcasts as soon as that was possible and available. So, we just, so we've kind of established that media plays a very important central role in, in, in perception. So, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's like when uh, Black Lives Matter first popped up, um, I thought that was the most innocuous, but uh, uh, the most non-anything statement to be said, like Black Lives Matter. And then Fox News said, oh, they're terrorists. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it's like, how do you get Black Lives Matter to terrorism? And now mm -hmm. it's a regular thing to where the president, Trump, mm -hmm. you know, they, they painted it in front of Trump Plaza in New York. And his comment on it was, that's a sign of hate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, 
<laughs> Black Lives Matter. Oh, it's a hateful thing. Yeah. Really? I mean, it's so like reality. James Baldwin, a uh, famous black author, had a, had a um, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, with another famous conservative speaker in the 60s, they had a debate. And um, what James Baldwin was saying was, if we look at the same thing, but we're in two different realities, you can't, you can't do anything. You can't function anywhere. And, you know, what I'm seeing a lot now with the Black Lives Matter, they're painting it on the, on the streets and this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, okay, but when we're talking on the subject here, Band-Aid solutions, like, all right, that's great, but what does that have to do? Or how is that going to help us in any way? Like, you know? It's not... Well, uh, that's well to me. Not the uh, painting itself. The painting itself is. <laughs> It's uh, to me, that's another Band-Aid solution. It's there to placate people to say, look, we're doing something. We <laughs> hear you. Um, but to me, you're not hearing us because um, I just read today that there some channel wants to make a documentary about Breonna Taylor. We don't want a documentary about her life and her <laughs> untimely murder. We want <laughs> we the want people who arrest- killed her <laughs> to be arrested. Yeah. This, mm. this is a Band-Aid solution. This is not even insane. It's ridiculous. This has this is not what we asked for, but yet you're giving it to us in hopes to do what? I guess you could say maybe they're spreading her story. Social media, black people, people who are just outraged have done that enough. You know what we want. A movie, a documentary on HBO is not it. That mm. is a band-aid solution, unfortunately. Mm. And I think we are getting to a point where we we're we're now deemed ungrateful that we are not mm. accepting these things. We're not, well, aren't you happy? You it's know, it's kind gaslighting. Of that thing. yeah, they're mm-hmm. gaslighting us where mm-hmm. it's like, well, you're getting a documentary about her. People are going to hear about her story. The word is getting out there. That's not what we asked for. We want the people who killed her in jail. We don't need portraits, more portraits of her on the street. We don't need movies. We don't need books. We don't need, to, we don't need any more of that. Now here's, here's the thing though. I see, I hear what you're saying, you know, um, we are fighting a behemoth of disinformation and ignorance because I think there's a lot of people and there's a big majority of white people, even anyone who's not black, because you, you don't know things if you've been indoctrinated in, into a system. Mm-hmm. And so when we say something, it always comes off as ungrateful because this long history of how we've been portrayed. We don't have the power to, we didn't have the power to um, mass produce these, um, these images. Mm-hmm. When you see Africa, it's always some starving kid with flies over his face. It's like, that's the whole of Africa. There's nothing happening in Africa besides this. And that's all you see. It's all we know. Um, if you go on like a couple of TED Talks, there's some prominent Ghanan women and others that are doing TED Talks talking about it and how the perception even of, of Africa itself has been, it's such a poor country, but, but the Western countries are going to help them, help these poor people who just can't seem to get their crap together. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they've been colonized they, and yes, and raped yeah. the entire... <clears throat> Yes, um, but, yeah. but, but that is the <laughs> yeah. role, that is Classic. the role, what we've been fed mm-hmm. in media, and that's why when we say things like, that are pretty normal and humanistic and, and, and have a right to say these things, it's always perceived less than, mm-hmm. because the continual media bombardment of who and what Black people are is not controlled by Black people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's controlled by a colonization kind of colonist type uh, mentality. And I say that, I mean, just look at the news. What is portrayed in the news? When I watched Icelandic news, and I've been here since 2002, I always said, if you watched Icelandic news, would you know there's an immigrant population in Iceland? (laughs) 
would you know that there's people of color who are born and raised in Iceland that are Icelandic for all intents and purposes? Mm -hmm. Well, I refer back to the, the, the <clears throat> protest again because the three of us didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. And then when we get to the protest, we couldn't believe just <laughs> how many spectrum of color other, before yeah. us. <laughs> and um, Jeffrey, like you were saying, so I am Ghanaian. Um, my name is Asantua. That is a very popular name there. The first time I went to Ghana in 2013, um, I was surprised that they were surprised that Black people existed outside of Africa. Um, for me, this was like uh, little kids were coming up to me and they were like, you're American? And, you know, they were just like, wow, like, you're real? And I was like, yeah. I was like, you know, so of course, <laughs> of course like, we are everywhere, baby. <laughs> you know, yeah. this is my thought. And they were like, uh, we, we didn't think there were people like us outside of Ghana. And I was like, yeah, you know, and a bunch of us that were, uh, came from the U.S. were there. And we were, some of us were black, some of us were white. Um, and so this for me, I was thinking, what do they see? Because for us, we knew uh, Africa is not just this big, starving, you know, continent of poor people. Mm -hmm. um, that was absurd. And, you know, we went and we, we learned and we had an amazing time and really just lavished in the culture. Um, and this is something that I was thinking, all people should do. This is great. I was like, why are we not here? <laughs> um, and now that you, you say... Uh, you know, about these TED Talks where Ghanaian people or people of all, uh, from all African countries are talking about, you know, what amazing culture and history they have, but also, um, I would say, economic resources that mm. Western countries are exploiting, of course. Um, we all have a phone that has lithium or nickel in it, mm. and this is all being taken from uh, Africa and many I would say many countries around the world that are being somehow exploited by another mm. Western of country. Of course, just like you can't um, continue to have H and M and and all of these mm -hmm. um, fast fashion, mass producing, yeah, fast fashion, any of it, you know, phones, clothes, mm -hmm. TVs, whatever. You can't do that if you think that um, you're going in and stepping on the necks of children mm -hmm. for labor. You can't, you know, it's like you can't have a civilized society believe that. So you must create a scenario mm -hmm. where you're going in and helping these poor people as opposed to have stripped them of their resources and then mm -hmm. selling them right back to, you know, for their slavery. Like you, so you there, we are. there we are. The, <laughs> there we are again at the role yeah. of what we are fed mm -hmm. and the images that we see and the, and the major, the mass majority of images of anything black has nothing to do with any, even in education, which is really sad to me. It's 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 a um, it's a crime. I don't really care what race you are. I would like to know, like like who are the heroes? Who are the the Latin American heroes or the Latin heroes or the Asian heroes or whoever has contributed to society or civilization? Period. I just and wonder how many people uh, think about the fact that when they've had heart surgery, they can thank a black man for that. They have no clue. And that's the thing. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Plasma. You know, yeah. it's like, so in the white mind that is uneducated or ignorant, and I mean ignorant in a, in a way that you just don't know, mm -hmm. when a black person says something, you have no reference as to their relevance there's no reference in your in your mind and your in what you've learned to to relevant people. The, the one thing you might know is, oh, they were enslaved, but you don't know much else. Like, do you know uh, the inventions that were in in the United States alone? Mm -hmm. Do you know um, Aesop's fables comes from Africa? Do you know any of this? I didn't know any of this until I started reading, and I had to. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, I had to do it myself. So what is the edu what education are you receiving? And if you have in Iceland, you have those who are not purely Nordic, um, what education are they getting? What education, like what are they learning? So what is their base for relevance in their life? How, do they, how are they gonna see themselves if they're never represented, if if there's no information there about them in, in that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
but I think what's interesting about even the band-aid solutions I have a friend who's actually he's uh he's an artist has been an artist his whole life he's um but you know has worked in corporate scenarios doing um graphics and digital media, that kind of stuff. And he's recently painted a mural outside of a major museum in um, Seattle with a collective of artists who painted the street. Um, they each took a letter and did um, their own uh, artistic interpretation of each letter, Black Lives Matter on the street in Seattle. And the way that's galvanized them and empowered them to mm -hmm. not just be the artists that they are born to be and, and express their sorrow and their frustration and their pain and their hope through art. It's also created a conversation in Seattle, which I believe is kind of, it's a sister Nordic city. There's a lot of uh, people from Nordic countries there. And so it's like a similar vibe of like, no, no, we don't have problems here. Everyone's living just as all copacetic. And it's like, no, 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 <laughs> there's some deep rooted issues. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming to the surface and a lot of action being taken um, because the conversation's begun and because the floor is open. So it's not that the paintings in and of themselves are there to satisfy the need. It's up to us to keep pushing forward and it's exhausting. Um, but that's why we have a baton. <laughs> you know, it's a relay race. It is not, um, it's not a sprint. So, um, I see, of course, we, ha we need everything available, every tool available mm -hmm. to get this message and to get um, to truly educate people because we all learn different ways. We learn through experiences. We learn through talking. We, you know, the, the griot tradition is real. That's a big mm -hmm. piece of how we share information, no matter what the culture. So, mm -hmm you know, the fact that people are, are doing this is creating a lot of momentum. Now, mm. again, I, I'm totally with you on the, you know, we don't need a, yet another mm -hmm. um, documentary about Breonna Taylor. No, we need action. So <clears throat> that's why we're here in media saying, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> we don't need a, another painting of her, you know, although that is helping to keep you know, all the social media presence around it is helping to keep that in people's mm -hmm. minds, but it can't just be stuck here, mm. you know, translating that into action. So I'm, I'm of two minds or of a, an integrated mind about it that yes, um, creating projects around people and movements is only one part of what mm. needs to be done, but it's absolutely necessary so that it has visibility. You know, what we're doing has visibility and it's not so there's, just- there's, like there's multiple, <laughs> we're, we're coming at um, solutions to these issues mm -hmm. from, there's multiple uh, things happening at the same time. And I think one, of, so I think part of it has to do with media and its responsibility as far mm -hmm. as the main informer of excuse me, the main informer of society or population as a whole. Media plays a significant role in what stories they determine are worth talking about or, or, or presenting to their population. So media has a definite role. It, and we nice need to, to be have, there. <laughs> we yeah, need to it, be in it. Thank you, yeah, Ava and, DuVernay. <laughs> Thank and, you, Shonda Land. <laughs> you know, yeah, and um, and it's like and and we need to be entertain in entertainment because that is where most people are spending their time mm -hmm. so we're talking we're talking like the news media mm -hmm. uh we're talking education i think is very it's very uh important like uh, my, my wife is a is an educator uh administrator and um I what does say, education no, oh. mean now yes exactly it's like but having you you know we have kids from poland or other places here in iceland and i'm like okay you have a cultural night let's 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 bring up uh some information some historical uh, uh um things so the, it's a, it's an education it's not just one thing to be educated is to know many things right is to be uh, exposed to many things but we're only getting a narrow view and, and that narrow view, when you get to be an adult, does not inform you. It doesn't help you. 
it, it doesn't it, it's not a good stand uh, stepping point in which to engage the world if you're only getting that. So education, media, of course, entertainment. Uh, when I grew up, you know, people were some people questioned like why uh, the Black Panther was so uh, important. And there, and what was interesting about that movie? <laughs> what was interesting about that movie? I heard before in Hollywood they said, "Well, it's not. It doesn't have universal appeal." That blew my mind because I'm like, universal appeal. That means in Asia and other countries that are not European, uh, that the only thing they will accept is white superheroes or whatever. Because white um, is universal. White is the universal. White is right? the norm. So, is the norm right so I was like, india is a subcontinent mm -hmm. and china has the largest population in the world okay yeah <laughs> so yeah exactly exactly but white That's is the definitely. norm so mm -hmm. you know they're like oh it would never sell but then when that movie came out and they went to different premieres around the world i, I followed the cast as they went to south korea and what was beautiful what really just oh it was the, it was the kind of world just a glimpse of what I would love to see is that the people in those areas came out in their traditional costumes. In their traditional dress. Mm -hmm. The Koreans came out in traditional Korean costumes. In Africa, they came out in their traditional garb. It was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. And it was like, it wasn't about, oh, this is Black Panther. The cast was like almost in tears because it was a celebration of culture. And that's like weird because it's a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is good. Um, we don't call it costume. We call it traditional yeah, clothing, dress, yeah, um, really. just to not demean anyone. Um, but also, I think that is very big of <clears throat> this speaks to what people actually want to see and how they want to support it. And that white is not the norm. White is not the standard to measure. Um, and like you, you uh, Dory spoke about the crack epidemic in media. So I thought of, um, so for the crack epidemic in the 80s, especially in New York for black people, the Band-Aid solution was to put people in jail. As we saw in media, we had movies like New Jack City um, that I watched as a kid, horrified me. I, um, I was not alive during the 80s. So for me, that was like, wow, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine seeing such things like kids in school playgrounds with needles and things around mm -hmm. that was horrifying but that was to that was um, a regular occurrence yeah mm -hmm. and, and in black media like new things like new jack city um or for example mm -hmm. nypd blue having like the black crackhead was the thing it was funny it was it became you know um a source of entertainment and i also understand for black people we needed to laugh at our own pain because mm -hmm. that was a way of us coping mm -hmm. um but on the other hand a real solution when white people, uh, meth, heroin, um, all these things that start to affect the white community that were seen as a major epidemic as well, they had real solutions. They didn't have band-aid solutions. They were not just thrown in jail. They had rehab. They, they expensive rehabs mm -hmm. at that because there's money in that. Um, they had rehab. They had help. They had all these resources, whereas... Um, as soon as it came to black people, it was like, put them in jail. <clears throat> and yeah. so that led to other problems like drugs being in jail and all these other well, things. Well, the, the 80s was an avalanche mm -hmm. of crimin criminalizing humanity. Mm -hmm. you know, drug addiction, mental illness, um, even just physical illness, because that's when everything got defunded. Yeah, also and, with um, HIV and AIDS, that's very absolutely. big. Um, and that also affected the undesirables of society, black people, um, the LGBT QIA community. So this became, and, and like, and once again, um, it was unspoken about and it was okay when they were dying until um, a lot of rich white men who were having okay. sex with other men or maybe in the closet started getting HIV and dying from AIDS. It was like, whoa. And there's a, 
I don't. It's a, I but guess they let the first. They let the first round of those die off because it's like, well, there's only a few mm-hmm. of those. Then yeah. once it started to really infiltrate. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh no. <laughs> there needs to be some education on what's happening, and um, you know, because that also is spread through sex, but also through um, unclean needle use. Mm-hmm. There was a girl, uh, a young white girl in New York. She got HIV and she died uh, relatively quickly. She was young. She was a woman. I mean, she was rich. So this was, you know, very. Um, at the time, it was like only young gay men get this mm-hmm. and they're they're un, unworthy of society because they don't have money. And, no, and, and in order to turn around the perception, <clears throat> mm-hmm. they drag out Ryan White, this little boy mm-hmm. who had AIDS from a blood transfusion. Mm. And that became the centerpiece to turn the, the stigma right around that AIDS wasn't just for, you know, condemning gay people to hell. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a black drug addicts. So, um, yeah, then that was when we started to see more people involved in AIDS charity, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, you know, across the board. And then it wasn't sinful to, you know, help. Then you have to be understanding because these yes, innocent because people white got, got it. Yeah. And, and please, right, Ryan got fantastic. HIV yeah. and now, now it's time to care. Um, yeah, so exactly. for me, that's another, another perspective of uh, band-aids, but across, you know, the races, mm-hmm. uh, how for, what is a band-aid in the black community? What is a band-aid in the white community? Even when we see, uh, you see films, for example, depicting drug use, mm-hmm. um, often when it's uh, white people, they're having some struggle in rehab and they have family that care about them and they want them to get help. And uh, it's done in a, a healthier way. Whereas when it's seen in black cinema, it's they're in jail, they're ODing, they're killing, robbing, you know, that's it. There is no, uh, there's very, I see very few examples of success when it mm. comes to rehabilitating black drug addicts. Whereas with white people, that's, that is the only option. That is the only route. Right. This is this 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 thing about media. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard about the T- Tallulia, Texas uh, case, where a white off a white policeman um, in a town that's ten percent African American, five thousand residents. Um, he did an arrest of forty six people, thirty nine of them black. Um, it was a raid in the middle of the night and they, it was on the news and they had pulled these people out of their homes and their nightgowns and whatnot and, and had arrested them and the news media said the, the police taking out the garbage. And it was an all black uh, neighborhood. And uh, then when everything went to trial, come to find out that this police officer was the only one who brought these allegations. Uh, he didn't have backup, he didn't record anything. He said he wrote down notes on his leg, which he later washed off in the shower, um, that these people had sold drugs to him. Was this All recently? This was uh, July of 1999. Oh, I was like, uh, this. No, 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 no. Yeah, I'm, but hey. But honestly, would I be that surprised if it happened you know, in July, it's like 2020? People, it, it, so what happened was they threw out all these cases. That one one case, you know, it was a guy who was like five four, and the guy had said he was six something, you know. And and another case was a woman. I mean, he men, women, children, old, young, poor. It didn't matter. He just threw half of his population in in, in jail. Okay, and the news didn't investigate. They they didn't investigate the story. Was what I'm saying. So. Come to find out, none of these people had sold drugs to this police officer. And it comes to find out, of course, he has a checkered racial past. You know, his his and he was he was dismissed from other police departments because they found him to be, found him to be mentally unfit to be an officer. But some other department picked him up. They passed and him along that way. No surprise. He had no he had no evidence. Just his word that put took these people out of their lives and criminalized them and it was and on the news it was just oh you know uh they're taking their garbage out these drug dealers because they're in a poor neighborhood nah, 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 nah. and it's like that blew my mind but when people say why do black people keep bringing this stuff up it's because it's always there 
And it's always there because of that perception. Okay, that, 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 you know, I don't even realize it sometimes, you know, it infects everyone. Mm -hmm. And so the solution is education. Media has to take a responsibility. We have the internet. It's great we have shows like this where we can counter these narratives that are thrown at us. Whether, and, and, and the news has changed in the States, especially because it's more enter, enter, enter infotainment. You know, it always got to be Info? sensationalized. Like, where's the information? It's like mm-hmm. I mean, they use it. The thing is, they use it to inflame black and white. It's it's really aggravating because it's like, just give me the facts. I don't really care if it's colored one way or another. I want the facts so well, I can make it. Let's call it what it is. It's propaganda. Yeah. There you go. You know, you're pushing an agenda that, and and it it has nothing to do with information. It has nothing to do with empowering, educating, or informing people. It has to do. So what's crucial. But not, (laughs) but not all media. Um, It's, you know, it's like, we have to learn our discernment and, you know, take our time to pull this apart. And um, like I said, like we have to engage you so know, in a country like Iceland, with 300,000 people or so, um, which has a, a deep-rooted understanding of who and what they are, I would yeah. I would think, um, what for what about its minority population? What what? And this is one thing that I've always kind of wondered: having children who consider themselves in the world as Iceland, Icelandic, Icelanders, and the definition of what that is or what that means to be. Uh, Cause to tell you the truth, if, and I don't know what they learn in school historically, except for the sagas and things like this. Um, the education they get from uh, their African American roots comes from me. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if it's, if, if any other culture is mentioned or referenced in their education as to their contributions except for maybe the Greeks um, so my point is what 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 in Iceland uh, helps the minority population even integrate because that's the other thing like um, in the states you see looting and rioting and it's like because we can never be a part of what you say you you are you never want us to be apart you, you never want us to be together you always want us to be separate and there's always that dividing line it's like like i said before america african americans have fought in every freaking war in america and still we're looking at police brutality we're looking at we're hearing the same racist you know bs you know welfare queens and they don't want to work and all this BS, it's like, really? We're still hearing this crap? It's like nobody's learned anything? Nobody's learned their history, you know? That African-Americans built that country and have had a hand in the, the contributions in the world? It's like, so, so, so in Iceland, how does an Icelander... Like when I see my kids' uh, yearbook picture, and there's like one, two tan kids in a sea of blonde hair, blue eyed. How do they embrace? How do they embrace? Do they embrace their minority population, or is it that population that I serves was, us? I it's would that say population that serves us, and we don't have to listen to. Um, they're people of color. They're they're there's nothing minor about us. Um, I think, for example, like you said, with your kids, I feel like that would always, um, for them, their quickest and closest point of reference would be you. It would start at home with whoever is their um, their closest person of color or black person. That's you. Um, I think instilling that in our youth and our kids is what's going to make them carry that with them. Because as we see in Icelandic society, like uh, as someone who's part Ghanaian, I could not send my kid to school and expect them to learn all about Ghana. 
I would have to teach them that so that when they are taught certain things in class, they know what to question and they know that that's wrong. Because if I'm not teaching them and I also know the society they're in is not teaching them, I can't question like, why don't you know these things or why aren't you proud to, you know, of where you come from? Because I haven't taught them anything. So I feel like as a, as a, a would-be parent, that's going to be on me first and foremost and even on the kids that um, I, I influence now. I think they're not taught um, about their blackness, no matter what cultural background they come from, especially if they're living just with maybe uh, their white parent. They don't know about Tanzania or Gambia or Ghana or Senegal. So that has to start with us. And then also going into schools and having this conversation about Africa as a continent and the 54 countries in there about Black Americans, about Black Latin Americans, about Black Asians, because Iceland, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think. (laughs) (laughs) No, I love how you said that because, you know, it's like in America when they talk Asian, they Mm -hmm. think Chinese. (laughs) And it's like there's more to Asia Mm -hmm. than Mm -hmm. China. But but continue. I love and this, that you said um, that. And this is, uh, I think, a part of the problem where we talk, talk about Iceland's purity problem is that to be Icelandic is to just be white. White, Icelandic speaking, maybe with an Icelandic name. If those are your three qualifiers, they're pretty crappy. Um, there has to be more to who you are as a people. Um, and I think, like I was saying here, if we want them to learn about Black culture, it's not just... Uh, hip hop from America, Crystal and slapping women and pimps and hoes. We need to uh, provide that in schools because we see what they're intaking in the media. We see it ourselves and we're like, no, this can't be it, you know? Mm. Um, so I think that's also, I'm glad that we have something like this. Uh, we are talking about this. We have Black Lives Matter Iceland. We want to talk to people about um, your particular culture and just the overall Black experience that's something that we can all relate to, even though we come from different backgrounds. We're of different ages and sexes. And, you know, we can all go into some place and have uh, the same experience uh, that a white Icelandic person will have no idea what we're talking about. Mm. And similarly with, um, you know, uh, continuing on that thread of education, and it's obviously not just going to be in school, it's what what are you intaking. So that's why I'm I'm super happy with uh, Erlander magazine and to be working with them. I'm going to be doing, um, I'll be copy editor on their next issue and really. Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) And and I, I just love that we're seeing this grow. So this is the action behind the you know, the event, whatever it is, whether it is um, a protest, a mural, um, something happening on the news, whatever it is, like keeping the momentum going and then investing those events with, with action and, um, and not just action, um, just resources. We're creating resources and we have to continue to do that and also acknowledge like, you know, we all had our need to have like the, the mental health downtime Mm -hmm. Um, just being able to acknowledge that that's another thing that, uh, black people and women and black women and trans black people and are just not allowed to have, you're not Mm -hmm. allowed to break down. You're supposed Mm -hmm. to be strong all the time. Otherwise what's wrong with you. So that's another, um, stamp of our sovereignty Mm -hmm. and, and turning this conversation around in media, in the presence of others, like, no, we are fully human. And when it's time to rest, we need to do that. But, you know, here's the next generation. Here's another one who can come and educate you and mm-hmm. express their truth as well. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, Jeff. No. Um, I was just, just going to say about uh, to tail end on what you said. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's also important that there, there are those who, uh, Icelandic, who may be curious and uh, how do you feel about, um, you know, because it is exhausting to, mm-hmm. to go out of your way, but also to have that, uh, that, that patience maybe in, mm-hmm. in, in, in um, allowing people to ask questions, you know, uh, without, you know, coming at them in any way. Mm-hmm. Cause I've oh, seen, yeah. I've seen, that's why we I've take seen, breaks. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've seen people in the States, well-meaning uh, people from, from, the Caucasian persuasion asking a 
uh, someone they know black Sorry. about something and they get a pushback mm -hmm. like you know you should learn yourself and it's like yeah but let's do the let's do the conversation let's if you can you know mm -hmm. um I think like you said doing that. yeah yeah you know, but I allow people to I mean, this Have between all of at least the three of us. Yeah, I think part of it is also um, a, a big part, I would say, is unlearning these colonized thoughts, behaviors, and this mindset. And I think mm -hmm. now is a time where we're all in that process. Um, yeah. And I think if you're not in that process, that means you want to stay in that mindset. Because um, I feel like now we're, we're at a, a time and age technologically, um, information wise like you said when people want to have that conversation and sometimes they get the pushback of go educate yourself you know what you want to know um you know where we can find useful resources now uh quality educative resources from black people not just white men you know armchair anthropologists telling you this is what black people like go do that um you so you have all that access now and we're all at a point where we're trying to unlearn these things like um mm -hmm. we were always called minorities and now we don't call ourselves that we call ourselves people of color things like um like you said costumes and like oh it's you know traditional clothing we're not this is not something you put on and take off and that's mm -hmm. for play um so we're all unlearning this and as you said we're creating resources um, I think the like the struggle now is that we're doing this all at once. We're creating these resources mm -hmm. at the same time. We're mm -hmm. fighting at the same time. We're trying to have these conversations. We're trying to do it all simultaneously, and, and it is fire joy in our lives. Um, yeah, <laughs> we're trying to be happy and be yeah. mentally healthy. It's a lot of work, and it may not seem. I mean, mentally, it is. Um, like you said, there are times when I need mental breaks, and I feel like you can't take a break right now. You haven't done enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, but I know that's that's that mindset of um. A western be culture better, like man. you need to keep doing you need to keep being better and i do want to be better than i was five years ago and i am um but i'm like you need to take a break get off mm -hmm. the phone get up do you know have like an hour to yourself to take a nap read a book do whatever mm -hmm. um the culture of, of business yeah, as well yeah, yeah. this is which exactly. covid gave us a break from except not iceland because yeah <laughs> our, We're still busy. shorter lived here. um <laughs> so i mean I think that's also a big part of all of this. We're still trying to get ourselves out of that colonized mindset where we have to do things like be busy. Um, we have to be as black people, like you said, uh, our word and our stories through the telling of, um, through the speaking is what keeps us alive and enriched. And I guess, strong in within each mm -hmm. other um we're still doing that just like on the show today um and i th i hope that with something that we're doing like these shows we get people talking of course um it's not just a matter of doing this for shits and giggles if you will um mm -hmm. there's meant to be something taken away from this and if nothing is then it's unfortunate and I have no interest. I have no interest in this us against them mentality that seems to break down so many things these days. You know what political group you're in, and so I don't talk to you, or you're stupid, or whatever. I have no interest in in um, that us against them, black against white. I don't have an interest in any of that. And when we talk about things that are racial, um, I think it, it it breaks down to that good and bad. And mo most people don't want to see themselves as bad, but um, I think the important thing, one of the most important things I think is the education aspect in that uh, we're talking about systems. We're talking, you know, most white people don't realize they're born into a system that benefits them or it's something they don't think about. Like they say, a fish doesn't know it's in water. So um, for me, I think it's, uh, it's important to make clear that, you know, a lot, a lot of times when we talk about these things and how they impact us, uh, it, it always leaves this us against them. Like I have to be defensive, uh, and it's not, it's not about that. It's just information. We want to be informed human beings. We want to uh, uh, have the fullest experience of people and ideas, and um, to to go the best way forward. Because no one group has you know solely been responsible for the progress of humanity as a whole uh it's been a lot of 
input, a lot of contributions, black, white, Asian, Latino, gay, straight. And the more information we have, the more our morality is changed and our, our, our thoughts are changed to a more relaxed position instead of a defensive position. Uh, so I think the education aspect is important, but I'm glad we had uh, this conversation. We're uh, coming to an end. So do we have any last um, thoughts? That was kind of my last thought. <laughs> well, I think it's important. Um, like you were saying, it's, I think when people take this in for the first time, um, it can get reductive. Like, you don't like me or you don't like us. It's like, no, that's not the point. And through media, through art, through our communications, we're going to have a much um, better time with integrating this, integrating our worlds, because that's really what's happening here. So no, it's, it's not all bad. Actually, this is like a big push forward that we're experiencing. And, um, it's important not to reduce it down to either or. So through these resources we're creating, through showing our humanity in every possible sense, through having the conversation, through saying, hey, I'm sorry, I can't have the conversation. Through saying, hey, you know, if you, yeah, you can Google it, but this is the place to look as opposed to, yeah, instead of running, letting people run in their own circle of disinformation, you know, at least having um, some resource available so that people can, look at information that's new that that refreshes and and brings us forward um i feel like we are we're a part of that we're doing that and that media can shift that as long as we keep pushing it and as long as we keep participating in it so um you know reducing the idea to this or that is is not going to help but when we expand and when we create circumstances where we can turn the band-aid into a solution that's when we're really you know moving forward and, and doing what's needful i agree oh that's a good <laughs> summation Dante, you have a last uh <clears throat> last point yeah and i think yeah i'm really glad we we uh went with this today and um I'm interested to see how it moves forward. I'm, I'm interested in the conversations on, on mm -hmm. Facebook and, and Instagram moving forward from this. Oh, no. I've seen, a, no, no, I'm, I'm here for it. I've seen a lot of great, interesting things pop up. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. No, I agree with what you both said. I think education is the biggest and most important thing that um, we need to be focusing on right mm -hmm. now and also building the resources for education, people like us, creating shows like this, speaking about topics like this, they are informing and they are, they can be used in the educational context. Yeah. Okay, well, Dori, Sante, as always, I love seeing you guys, love talking to you guys. Always Keeps a pleasure. Keeps me sane. Um, <laughs> yes. I'd like to thank Boye and Sam Stolen for yes, the thank opportunity. you so much. Um, thank you. This is a great platform and we appreciate the time. And for anyone looking in, you know, we appreciate, you know, just just being curious and, and uh, looking in. So until we uh, speak again, uh, thank you. And we'll say goodbye for now.